Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, panel on the God of Small Things at 25. Um, and I'm so, so grateful that everybody could make it on such short notice. And I'm really excited to get started uh, talking about the God of Small Things at 25. But first, I was hoping that we could all hold up our copy of the God of Small Things and I can uh, take a quick screenshot. Okay, very nice. So wait, command shift four, right? And screenshot. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna read um, everybody's bios really quick. Um, you know, going in alphabetical order. It's nine panelists, so you'll you know, have to bear with me. It's gonna take a bit. Um, so Anjali Njeti is an organizer, journalist, and MFA instructor. She is the author of Southbound, Essays on Identity, Inheritance, and Social Change, and The Parted Earth. Her other writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, Oxford American, Harper's Bazaar, Atlanta Journal Constitution, and elsewhere. Anita Felicelli, is that, is that the right pronunciation of your last name? Anita Felicelli is the author of Chimerica, a novel and the short story collection Love Songs for a Lost Continent, which won the 2016 Mary Roberts Reinhardt Fiction Award. Her short stories have appeared in the Massachusetts Review, Air Light, Alta, Midnight Breakfast, and other places. Her criticism and essays have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Alta, the San Francisco Chronicle, Slate, Salon, and the New York Times, Modern Love. She is the editor of Alta's California Book, Book Club, and the 2022 Fiction Committee Chair for the National Book, Book Critics Circle. Torsa Goshal, Goshal? Goshal. Sorry, Goshal. Torsa Goshal is the author of a book of literary criticism, Out of Mind, Ohio State University Press, and an experimental novel, Open Couplets, Yoda Press. Her fiction, personal essays, and interviews have appeared in Berkeley Fiction Review, Catapult, Los Angeles Review of Books, Literary Hub, Bustle, and elsewhere. She is an assistant professor of English at California State University, Sacramento, and a host of the Narrative for Social Justice podcast. Madhushri Ghosh's debut food narrative memoir, Khabar, An Immigrant Journey of Food, Memory, and Family, was published by the University of Iowa Press in April 2022. Her work has been a notable a notable mention in Best American Essays in Food Writing, Pushcart nominated and published in the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, The Writer, Long Reads, Catapult, Bomb, Guernica, LA Review Books, Lit Hub, and others. Phew. Devi S. Lasker. Lasker is correct, right? Devi S. Lasker is the author of The Atlas of Reds and Blues, winner of seventh annual Crook's Corner Book Prize 2020 for best debut novel set in the South, winner of the 2020 Asian Pacific American Award for Literature and the finalist for the Northern California Book Awards. Her second novel, Circa, was published in May, May 3rd, 2022 by Mariner Books. Her third novel, Midnight at the War, will be published by Mariner in early 2024. Meher Manda, is a poet, short story writer, journalist, and educator, originally from Mumbai, India, currently based in New York City. She is the author of the chapbook, Busted Models, No Dear Small Anchor, 2019, and her work has been published or is forthcoming in the margins, Barron Magazine, Los Angeles Review, Sparklet, Hobart Pulp, Peach Mag, Catapult, Epiphany, Cosmonauts Avenue, and elsewhere. She was a fellow of the Radical Poetry Consortium a Dream Yard and a Best New Poets and Best of the Net Anthology nominee. Vijaya Nagarajan is an associate press professor in the Department of Theology, Religious Studies, and in the Program of Environmental Studies at the University of San Francisco. Awarded the, awarded the Women's Studies and Religious Fellowship at Harvard University, the Fulbright American Institute of Indian Studies, the NEH Chair, the Davies Chair, she has also been awarded residencies at the Mesa Refuge Re Writing Residency and the Jurassic or D Jurassic? Jurassic? Jurassic. Writing Residency. Vandana Pava is a community focused writer and educator currently working on the programs team at the Asian American Writers Workshop, 
running fellowships, public events, and arts education outreach. She is also a writer focused on a variety of beats from style and beauty to music and television. You can find her bylines in Teen Vogue, Tomorrow Magazine, Catapult Magazine, and more. Malvika Prasid is the host of Your Favorite Book, a podcast focused on highlighting the diverse literary influences of writers and readers alike. She is also a longtime contributor and book reviewer for the Chicago Review of Books. Her short fiction has been published in Koryo, Plain China, Revisions, and elsewhere. She holds degrees from the University of Notre Dame and the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. So welcome to all the panelists. And um, yeah, like I said, very, very, very excited and thrilled uh, to be here today talking with you. So I have a couple of questions, but like, I think that we can just go with the flow and like, I'm just happy for anybody to jump in and kind of like ask questions amongst the panelists. Um, everybody else can ask questions in the chat and we will uh, try and like get as many questions answered as possible. Nani, uh, if, if I may interrupt, could we yeah. uh, talk about your book also? Oh. Yes, <laughs> let's introduce you. Oh, wait. I'm going to do it. Oh, thank you. That's Here we so go. Fine. That's so wonderful. Okay. Nahid mm -hmm. is a graduate of the MFA program at Columbia University School of the Arts. Her writing has appeared in the New, New England Review, The Guardian, HuffPost, Scrollin, Bomb Magazine, Public Books, Pen America, The Rumpus, Europe Now Journal, A Symptote Journal, and elsewhere. And this is her beautiful new book that just came out. Oh. Yay! Thank you guys. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have let as many people, everybody who was waiting, I've let them into the in, in here. Um, I request everyone except for the panelists to keep your mic and camera off just uh, because you know I don't want to get like overwhelmed. Um, so my first question for everybody is the basic question, like where were you when it happened? So like, where were you? And who, more importantly, who were you when you first encountered the God of small things? I'll jump in. Um, so in 1997, I had uh, just uh, the year before uh, completed graduate school in New York at Columbia. And I was back to being a reporter and I had landed a job at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution covering government and crime which for the last four years before Biden took over were the same beat. And then, um, <laughs> and then I, uh, somebody told me that uh, Arundhati Roy had come out with a book and I searched high and low and a friend of mine sent me my copy um, and I fell in love, so. Yeah, I can jump in um, after Devi. Um, I, this is actually a signed book of wow. um, Arundhati wow. in 2007. <laughs> so I stood in line at City Arts and Lectures in San Francisco, like a long snake of a line, probably at least an hour uh, when the hardcover came. And I also waited in line for the soft cover when it came a year later. Um, <clears throat> I was actually on the cusp of finishing my dissertation and starting a new job, the job at USF. So I've been there 25 years. So it actually marks exactly <laughs> the time. And I was actually finishing up the dis my dissertation on the column, which ended up becoming a book called Feeding a Thousand Souls. And <clears throat> it was, I was just, you know, in this moment of trying to figure out how to write, you know, and try to like kind of escape the scholarly gloves <laughs> as much as I can. And I think she just broke open the literary in a way that I hadn't seen since Salman Rushdie. It was like she did a whole other level of breaking. And it was, it, I, like Devi said, I fell in love with her and with the book and her voice. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you. I can jump in. Um, so um, actually in 1997, 98, I have no memories of that. Um, and like, at the time, I knew nothing about Arundhati Roy. I was in India and uh, I was in school. It was only when I was, I think, in 11th grade uh, in 2005 or so, 
when um, a teacher of mine in the library class basically told me, I mean, she was looking at the kinds of books I was picking up. Um, and she said, there's this book you might uh, enjoy reading. And she gave me The God of Small Things. Um, and that, that changed so many things for me. Um, I, I think God of Small Things is one of two or three um, books that um, that made me want to uh, lead a life that was completely immersed in literature as reader, writer, and uh, I, I have I actually have a couple of vivid, very embodied memories of that time. Even I didn't know so much about the Booker Prize. I didn't know that this book had um, gained like all this kind of attention. So my early memories of the book are very, very personal and embodied. Like I remember the sensory details um, that the book offered. I remember crying profusely at the end, uh, even though we foresee all the deaths, but it, it, it broke my heart. And so uh, so that's that's who I was, I guess, a school student who was just kind of, um, you know, being exposed to this sort of writing uh, about India in India um, when I first read the book. I guess I'm probably going to jump in because my story is kind of similar. Uh, it's, it happens a few years after that, about uh, 2000, I want to say seven, I, I was transitioning from seventh to eighth grade uh probably not old enough to be reading this book uh but uh i was already dabbling with texts that i shouldn't be dabbling with so <laughs> an aunt um a distant aunt actually you know lent me her copy which i never returned uh lent me her copy of the book and and suggested i i read it you know um and i and i it was in, this happened in hyderabad i brought it back to me to bombay and uh i remember reading it and feeling very confounded by the last 20 pages uh, and not really registering the the octave of grief because I, you know, because I was too young to parse what was happening in the last 20 pages. I could tell you what happened. I just didn't know what it meant, right? I just didn't know how those pieces came together. And I think I read it again, like I put the book aside, but I never returned the copy and I read it again. Um, you know, just after my 10th board exams, it was the first book I picked up. Um, and that's when, and that's when it hit me, you know, that's when I guess the enormity of the story hit me. Um, so yeah, kind of very similar story, pass it on. I can jump in as well. My, uh, my story is pretty different, I think, from what I've heard across the board. So um, in 1997, I was two years old. So this book did not register for me for quite some time, but um, I actually only read this book for the first time about six months ago. And that was because um, a guest on my podcast, your favorite book had chosen this as her favorite book. And as I do with all the books on my shows, I read them. And this book had been on my radar for so many years. This copy is my mother's. She's had it my whole life pretty much. And um, I felt so immensely seen by this book in the sense that uh, my parents are from Kerala. I'm ethnically Malayali American. And so seeing Malayalam sort of in this book and seeing Kerala where I always went for summers to see my family just portrayed in literature. That was my first experience really seeing that on the page. And then just seeing the amazing ways this book played with time. And this book really felt like I was reading one of the almost foundational, it almost felt like an ancestral text in the sense where I was missing so much context and now I have it. There was this completeness that I just felt reading it. And I have uh, shouted this book's praise whenever I can in the past six months or so, and it's a privilege to talk about it. My story is, is pretty similar to Malvika's um, and also a little bit of Meher's. Um, I was also about three years old when the book came out, so it was not um, something that was on my radar for much, much later after it already kind of became this um, foundational piece of literature for our community. Um, I first read it when I was probably too young to be reading it when I was in middle school and it never, it didn't really like, like hit me. I was a big book. I was a big bookworm. So I felt like it was a book that I read because I had to read it. Like I knew that it was so important to the community um, and I had heard so much about it. So I picked it up and it didn't really register and resonate as much as it should have until I reread it later when I was um, probably towards the end of high school um, entering college. And I really definitely felt that kind of completeness that you were saying, Malvika, that this was like 
a text that has been around, you know, as long as I've been alive, basically, and um, the completeness of finally being able to understand it and resonate with it um, in a way that, you know, all of you have was, was really special. I'll jump in here. Um, uh, I'm just so, it, it's so amazing to listen to some of you writers who were, who were a few months old at that time, because um, when I started, I was 27 years old. Uh, when I got this book, I was in DC. I was a scientist. I still am a scientist. Um, but I knew of Arundhati Roy and, and the outlier activities that she's been doing since she was a kid and uh, also her mother. And so she was in, uh, she was in architecture school in Delhi where I come from. And, um, and, uh, and then she wrote two screenplays. So we knew, we, people of my generation in Delhi knew her as a film person, as an architect, um, someone who made beautiful designs, but decided to move into writing because she wanted to test her uh, Apple computer. I think that was the rumor that was on. So, uh, um, but I think when you read this book and you see that from chapter one, you know exactly where this is headed and yet you, you kind of sit there and wonder maybe that's not going to happen and something else is going to happen because we all believe in Hindi movies and romance. <laughs> um, for me, it was it was uh, it was a revelation and it was also a, a point that I decided on my own that I too could write even though I was in science um, and I I too could write in English, which is a colonizer's language, but. Uh, represent my my words and my my feelings through a language that everybody else can understand so it was mind-blowing 25 years of this yeah i'm happy um, to jump uh, in. oh sorry who wants okay i'll go quickly um i the god of small things was a group of first texts for me um, by Indian American authors. I was 24. I had just gotten married. I was two thirds of the way done with law school. I grew up in a small city in the deep South. Uh, only one of my parents is Indian. We were not immersed in the very small Indian community that was in my Tennessee city. And so I had very little Indian American cultural knowledge until a few years earlier when I first read Bharati Mukherjee's Jasmine, and then began reading all of her books, and then uh, Chitra Dabakaruni's books, and then I, I was going through whatever literature I could find. I picked up the book at the bookstore without having heard anything about it yet, soon after it was published, because I liked the cover, and I saw, oh, there's an Indian name, and that's what got me to read the book, and I was blown away um, by the structure, by the prose, and the, one of the first things that had, I had been a lifelong reader that had, who had only, who had primarily been exposed to books by white American authors. And the first thing I thought of was, of course, this book had to first be published and born in another country. Cause I didn't think there was any way that US publishing would have picked up this book first. Um, and this was when I was not even a writer. I was simply a reader. I had no ambition at that time at 24 to be a writer. I didn't know it was a possible option for me. Um, it was never presented as something that I could do. So I didn't believe I could, but it made me really, uh, it was one of those uh, first books I read where it made me really see uh, what Indians uh, were capable of leaving a cultural mark in the United States, right? It right. was a book that, that, I mean, when you think about the fact that it was 1997 and it was one of, of a few books by Indian authors that had such a big impact in the US, right? There weren't that many then. Um, that's what was so remarkable to me um, be, because few books had made that kind of uh, worldwide mark, particularly in what was then a, a very narrow type of of, of, of readership in the United States. I mean, thankfully a lot has changed in 25 years. Um, and I'm so grateful that I got to read this book then because it really made me think more uh, and ask more questions about why Indian literature 
why it was so uh, inaccessible in the United States and why it wasn't receiving the kind of, uh, uh, you know, I think I, I remember uh, Midnight's Children, for example, um, and then the satanic verses and, and um, but it, it made me realize that uh, Indian literature born of India really, uh, what, what were we missing? What was I missing as a reader uh, during that time? I know I was super grateful. I'll just jump in for a second that it that it had it was in English because I know I've missed so many good books because they haven't been translated, and I don't you know I don't read in 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 a lot of the other languages. So yeah, I think we may have one more panelist, right? I'll go. Sorry, I'm just sort of conserving my voice here. Um, so 1997, I was in the middle of college. I was an English major. I was a writer. Um, I had encountered other uh, Indian writers because the UC Berkeley library is like, it has its own, UC Berkeley has its own like South Asian studies um, department. So I had, but, um, but I still was blown away by this book. My dad got it for me actually. And it was like finally a, a reflection of uh, life in India that, that, mirrored what he what he said and so I I understood it for that reason um and I hadn't seen that in other books like when I went to India like my cousins were like oh you know a suitable boy or like they were they made recommendations to me but those were not um environments of India that have any personal connection to my family and so um so this was the first book where I was like oh I kind of recognize the different things that are happening in this book um, in a way that I, I don't necessarily recognize like arranged marriage narratives or like those kinds of things that those are a little bit more removed for me. Um, so yeah, I, it was, it was, uh, mind blowing because it actually reflected something that I thought I understood. And that was not since I hadn't had that experience, um, reading Indian literature. I, uh, I was really taken with it and I became like a huge earned at the Roy fan. My dad was also. So we went to go, you know, see her speak and things like that after that. Um, so I, I, I found that really interesting. I, I also had a, um, a corollary to this question because like, I feel like we're a good mix of like first gen and second generation South, Indian, uh, South Asian um, writers here. And like, for me, you know, the cultural touchstones, like this, it's such a nineties book, like all the, like the chiclets and the, there's so many things that I, I don't know if you didn't grow up in India in the nineties or you too, maybe you wouldn't like, that wouldn't connect with you. But I find it really interesting in the ways that everybody has kind of connected with the book. And also what I find really interesting is like, not everyone here really found out the, about the book because of the book of Christ it was also like, in, oh, it also won the Booker Prize. Like, it wasn't like, that's the reason why I sought out this book. Um, and I feel like a lot of us who were kids when the book came out, the book kind of just floated into our orbit. Like, you know, it was like just this book that suddenly appeared on our parents' bookshelves and we kind of ignored it for a couple of years. And then finally, we're like, okay, let's figure out what the fuss is all about, right? But I was, um, Anjali said something really interesting that I have a question about, which is about like, why weren't we seeing these kind of books being published in the US uh, in the Western hemisphere of publishing? And I was just wondering, like, there was an essay that came out recently that went viral on cultural essentialism in Astra Mag. Um, some of you may have read it. And I was just wondering, like, in a, you know, when you talk about cultural essentialism, like, do you feel that, you know, wildly successful South Asian novels, like The God of Small Things have expanded or shrunk the boundaries of what the dominant literary ecosystem expects from South Asian writing? Like, has it helped or hindered what, we have, what, what we've been given permission to write about in a way, you know? Well, I wanna just jump in and say that, you know, um, this book, I mean, you know, I think what Anjali said earlier about, you know, Chitra Banerjee's books and then Parthi Mukherjee's books, right? Like that's all we could get for a long time, right? And then I think when actually this book came out and then a couple of years later, Interpreter of Maladies came out. And I think a couple of things happened, right? Right around that time. I think when Interpreter of Maladies came out, it actually did shrink the pool because everybody kept going, well, we have the one 
in South Asian writer and she won the Pulitzer Prize, what else are you guys gonna gripe about, right? <laughs> but then I think that, I think that then, then there was suddenly something shifted and I think now it's very different, right? I think it has just expanded the horizon. I think we've all just kind of gone with it and been like, nope, she she's a great writer. You know, I love this book. I love all of her work, but she's also opening a door. She's not shutting the door. And I think we've all like had the opportunity now since, and now that this book has like been like a staple for 25 years, right? Like we're just rushing through the door now. And I think it's only <laughs> expanding. And I and I hope it keeps expanding because honestly, you know, publishing is still 86% white and male and heteronormative. And, you know, <laughs> we we have a lot of work to do, <laughs> right? So I, I actually have a slightly different take from that. And it, so I do understand what Devi is talking about in terms of opening the door, but I also think that if you're thinking about, uh, you know, permission to write in different styles, uh, permission to uh, use different kinds of structures, I feel like, I mean, as writers, we are just seizing it, yes, but in terms of what is accepted or expected of us, I don't think that has changed all that much in 25 years. Like, um, there would be uh, people who would expect a certain kind of uh, writing in English um, coming out of the very uh, American tradition of, uh, you know, short story writing and so on, um, uh, kind of imposed up upon the novel. And um, if one, if an, uh, a beginning emerging writer is writing a very, um, a novel that, you know, Arundhati Roy uses the word wild for the structure of the novel very often. Um, if one really writes in that wild way, I don't think one has an easy time getting um, agents, editors, publishers interested, um, even after a couple of decades, right? So I think, uh, at the aesthetic level, um, and it's not Arundhati the Roy's fault or anything, it's just that at the aesthetic level, it's not like the book has um, made a revolution happen in, in the literary ecosystem. I, can... I, I would, I would um, agree with Dorsha in the, in the sense that um, as writers, we forget that this is a business. Uh, so for publishers, when they come back and tell you, um, what does this represent or how does it's even there in movies you know when you're writing screenplays uh the risk tolerance and i'm talking like a corporate person but the return on investment is very important for this business to happen and so when you're going outside of the norm um you have to look at it from their perspective as to can they sell these books and in order for them to sell books if you're trying to change people's minds readership minds and it's not that easy uh, she did it fantastically, but uh, none of us can claim to be her. So what we are trying to do is is our what we think makes sense. And um, and when you have okay, you have gatekeepers, but you also have pe people who are not gatekeepers but are not taking the risk because they want a job, they want a paycheck as much as you and I do. So um, while we have the issues of uh, white publishing, we also have the issue of us as uh, uh, writers and readers of color, not really uh, highlighting um, how amazing our writing style is, which is very different from the Western writing style. And that takes time. We may be doing it now, but we may not be doing it, um, you know, as loudly, as boldly, as proudly as we need to in order for us to make change happen. I, I, yeah, I'll just dovetail for one second there. I totally agree. Um, you know, it is our job as South Asian writers and as writers of color and as, as, as women writers, right, that we just have to build community because we cannot do this alone, especially now, right? And I think like the fact that Nahid like, you know, <laughs> did this amazing thing and we did this community read and now we're together and like, we just need to build on this, right? Because this is the kind of thing that is going to uplift each other and uplift our community as a whole. And because no one is going to champion us as heartily as the people that, that are with us on the same journey, right? So 
Yeah, that's uh, beautifully put, Davy. Oh, sorry, who was jumping in? Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead, and then I'll go after you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, you know, answer Nahid's question and everybody else's responses too, is that, you know, when Arundhati, what really struck me about Arundhati Roy's book in 97, because I'd been following the South Asian writers and South Asian American writers um, and South Asian British writers, you know, for at least, I think, you know, since I was like 19 or 20, um, I remember reading Salman Rushdie's first novel, um, which is a really bad novel, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I told him to his face, you know, um, when I, you know, but I, so it's, it was a science fiction novel. It didn't work in any level at all, but, but, um, and when I was 19 and I, and I, so I'd been following and what was striking to me with Arundhati Roy was that she came from India and was able to enter the world stage. And with Rushdi, you know, he had come to England when he was 11, um, Chitra, Divakarani, Bharati Mukherjee, Naipaul, everybody was diasporic writers. And even though Arundhati writes a little bit about Washington DC in The God of Small Things, um, it's the fact that she's located primarily in India and writing out of that primarily Indian experience and then able to come to the world stage at a very high meta level. That just blew me away of that arc of movement of both her writing and herself, and that she's been able to occupy that world stage continuously for 25 years, you know, through her activist work and through all her other nonfiction books and things which I followed closely. So I think that that also, you know, I think caused attention to all, even the politics of India, you know, India's presence, you know, on the world stage. Um, at that time. So she, I think in some ways she was part of that contextual shift, um, you know, post 91, you know, just as Bollywood reflected it. And so she reflected some of that. And I think, um, and her ability to, you know, unlike I think Naipaul and um, Rushdi and the others was that because she'd had the experience of the political activism prior to her literary life, she was able to command attention at the political activist level. So she yeah. had these twin voices in a way. Um, and she was unembarrassed and just like herself, you know? And I think that really, that was like a, a new thing to me, even as herself, that was unlike the other South Asian American writers and the South Asian based writers. Um, and so I think um, her voice was really, um, incredibly compelling, I think. And um, like she did a wild thing, like Rushdi, to me, she matched Rushdi or even surpassed him in many ways because of the female centered and village centered, you know, folk centered. Um, you know, like Rushdi in a way, she followed um, sort of Indian narrative traditions and fused them with Western narrative traditions. And um, so I think she was very unusual. I don't think anybody else has quite done that. So Rushdie and her, you know, were sort of um, cousins, you know, <laughs> at the narrative, you know, so that's what really, really struck me. I, I wanted to actually echo that uh, when we were talking, when, uh, um, you know, in response to Nahid's original question, but also in response to Devi, um, uh, bringing up Jhumpa Lahiri, right, who published her first novel two years after The God of Small Things. Mm -hmm. And um, I think about, and again, through no fault of Jhumpa Lahiri, I think about how her work in that sense um, kind of made, uh, you know, acted as a bridge to where Arundhati's work was firmly rooted and centered, not just at the narrative level, where the entire story happens, you know, in this particular village, in IMNM, around the house, in the world, in the trees, in the flora and fauna, and the river around it, with very minor digressions, but also at, uh, you know, at a textual level, right, where there are words and there are stories and there are the recollection of folk tales and even the adaptation of, um, you know, Shakespeare uh, again and again and again at the textual level, right, at the pronunciation level, at the spelling level. And so this is a novel that resists any attempt to be anything but Indian, right? And to that end, I would even go as far to say to be anything but 
you know, rooted in the milieu of Kerala, right? It refuses to even belong to the rest of the country. It belongs firmly and very committedly to its place. And I think about also the role that the West plays in the story at a textual level, right? Where it is an aberration, where it is an escape for Chaco in the end when he leaves for Canada. Uh, it is not, you know, a place of, um, there's nothing ideal about it. There is nothing loved about it. There is no memory there. There is nothing to hold on to. Um, and so I think about how, you know, the emergence of Jumpa Lahiri, uh, you know, as someone said rightly, that, um, you know, American literature had their own Arundhati Roy moment with Jumpa Lahiri. And yet both of those writers are not, or never did the same thing and haven't either. Um, and I think about as someone who devoted uh, much of my adult life loving both Rashti and Roy growing up as, as a reader primarily first, I think about Rashti's betrayal of Indian politics in the last 10 years, his moving away, right? His adaptation of American politics, you know, the appearances on Bill Maher to talk about Trump over and over and over again. And then I see this writer who, you know, not only continues to live in the eye of the storm, all the political malevolence capable by the Indian state, but is also someone when she visits, I had the amazing opportunity to see her in conversation with Ria Tanwen in, in, at NYPL. And that was a conversation about India. It was a one and a half hour conversation, you know, about India, about colonization, about resisting and decolonizing our literature. And um, in that sense, yes, I, I think of her as the most, you know, to evoke the book, but, you know, to perhaps not evoke, uh, you know, the, the characters in the book, but like one of the most committed comrades of Indian literature in that sense, right? Uh, who is, you know, politically uh, consistent, you know, at a textual level and at a narrative level. Um, yeah, you know, Lahiri is writing in Italian now, right? So yeah. like, you know, things <laughs> Yes, that's right, that's right. <laughs> So I, one of the things I thought about most while reading this book, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, is if Roy was a complete unknown and tried to shop around this book today to an agent or an editor, I'm telling you, a small press might have picked it up, might have right. seen it interesting. How many debut authors in the U.S. who are not white get, get to write a, multiple points of view in a single passage I had meant to mark it while I was reading it, but there are multiple pages in this book where she enters the minds of multiple characters, where she goes from one paragraph, and there's no announcement of this, right? It's she just flows from one sentence to the mind of Rahel to, to Esta to uh, Amu. I mean, she goes all over the place with it. This particular timeline, right, which is no timeline, right, which is, which mm -hmm. is, you know, the sort of notion of, of, of a timeline in literature is a very sort of Western uh, 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 implementation, right? It's, it's, it doesn't really make sense in, in other cultures. But even today, I think this book from an unknown debut author would have trouble finding a publisher. I, am, I can just imagine them uh, mm -hmm. critiquing the book. Well, you know, it, it's confusing. Uh, you know, you, might, you go back and forth too much in the timeline um, within the same chapter. You enter the minds of so many characters at once. These are privileges granted to only white debut authors in the US, which is why this book couldn't have come from anywhere but India to make it big in the US. And uh, th this is why too, which even though Roy was writing in English, uh, this is why too, why I often ask myself the question of why can't we get more translated books published here from the subcontinent? Because this is the kind of storytelling which clearly US readers love because they purchased the book, right? It, I mean, it, it, if, if only South Asians in the US had published the book in the 1990s, it would not have generated any attention or profit, right? It was ultimately white readers who grabbed onto this book in the US, right? right. Um, you know, and, and that's what we think of, you know, when a book is successful in US publishing, it really is a question of how many white readers are gonna purchase the book, right? That that's what publishing is still geared around is what the white woman wants to read, unfortunately. 
that, 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 that is starting to change. I do have some optimism. But if Roy was submitting this book today to agents, would she have gotten a US agent with this book written exactly in this way? I would argue it's not likely. I mean, perhaps even if she submitted it to another Indian uh, uh, agent based in the US, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I think as much as this has expanded um, the minds of the US reader, uh, you know, of whatever race or ethnicity, uh, their background. I don't know whether US publishing would have embraced this book if Roy first started to try to get this published in the US. I, I, can, I want to jump in here a little bit and sort of um, like uh, address some of the comments in the chat as well about the fact that, you know, um, this is a book written by an Indian writer who has pretty much spent her life in India. And in as much as uh, I think many of us are based in the diaspora right now, I know I grew up in India. And um, uh, to me, what the US audience wants, like this was not something I was thinking about. Um, and uh, I guess many of us were not thinking about that. That. Um, and I think um, Arundhati Roy was not thinking about that clearly. Um, and so uh, what, what has been interesting to me is if any of us can think about how this book was received in India before it became hyper mediated by um, sort of, you know, the UK, US uh, criticism and this kind of critical culture. Um, uh, one of the, I tried to do some research on it, but the problem really was that um, I didn't come across that many reviews or, uh, you know, a takes on the book or from Indian media before it had already won the Booker Prize. Um, and I don't, uh, this was not a very thorough research. So I don't know whether uh, India, you know, the Indian media did not pay attention to the book at all before the Booker, or it was just a matter of like poor archiving or something. But there's, of course, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of takes on the book in the aftermath of the Booker. But um, yeah, because I think, you know, like, I feel a little uncomfortable in centering America in a discussion about uh, Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things specifically. And so, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking about. Um, if I could, uh, you know, if you look at the, some of the anecdotal and probably apocryphal um, stories behind the God. So the God of Small Things, I believe was first published by Aleph Books in India, which is a small independent press. So it definitely was not picked up by like a HarperCollins or a Penguin India even back then. Um, and from what the lore, which may or may not be accurate, but what I heard was that Pankaj Mishra found the book. That's right. And he read it That's all true. night on a train. And he was so excited that he jumped off at the nearest station, wherever the train stopped and called Arundhati Roy. And by the miracle of the 90s, spotty telephone, something, <laughs> they were able to connect and he told her how much he loved the book. And then he was one of the first like champions or gatekeepers who then kind of brought it to the West, brought it to David Godwin, who again, like, you know, and she acknowledges this in her, in her, uh, in her acknowledgments that he parted the waters and came down to the now this like how many authors does this happen for you know like this is a real like layering of priv not privilege but like a layering of good luck and like good fortune for a book that definitely deserves it but that kind of championship and that kind of like you know discovery it's like you know it's like being you know being like Rene Russo being discovered on like the Hollywood Boulevard and like becoming a big star it doesn't happen for everybody mm -hmm. um, and just look at all the the serendipity that had to kind of gather for this book to become what it is mm -hmm. um, and then after that winning the Booker Prize so I think that yeah realistically like you know all of us, all of us South Asian writers are stacked up against much huge, bigger odds. And the odds of something like this happening for any one book is, is yeah. minuscule. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think also the fact that she had different lives in the other fields in Delhi as an actress, as a screenwriter, the daughter of a famous mother, you know, so it's like all those also gave her a certain 
what now we'd say the vocabulary is platform that was there and friendships that came out of that network and community, you know, of action. So I think that's the other thing that we don't think about often is like, you know, we're sort of, um, I mean, Arundhati Roy was already, she was an unknown in the literary world, but not in the other worlds that she moved Correct. in. Correct. Yeah. yeah so she, could that's, move that's, from, she could move from one yeah. island of fame to, it's much easier, there are bridges to cross the other, you know, islands of fame. So not, I mean, the book totally deserved it, but it's also without that other element, I think she could have been stuck, you know. Just, just to uh, piggyback on what Vijay said, um, as I mentioned earlier, in Delhi, she was known as an architect and an outlier, a person who moved to Goa, um, who lived in, a, in the slums, because um, she, she really is, continues to be an outlier. So when people were fixated on this book, uh, the fact is she had written screenplay, she had acted in movies, her partner uh, is in films. Um, so for people like us who've grown up in India a few years younger than her, this wasn't surprising, but but when you come here, again, to to talk about what Torsa just talked about in terms of India and, and, and talking about an Indian author, um, the, the fascination for uh, for a book of uh, uh, a novel that came out and then the fascination for us wanting another novel from her didn't really make sense because all she was doing was being creative. And if you read her nonfiction, if you read her activism, I, I feel this book is her activism. Um, just I agree. You know, I agree. In, in a imaginative world. Um, and so when the next book came out, it, people made a big deal of, of it coming out after two decades, but she's been doing this forever. So I think if you're asking somebody who's living in India, who's, who's followed her career and, and what she's been doing, she's been an activist through and through and she'll continue to be that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, Anita and Vandana, do you guys have anything to add to this question? Yeah. Um, I sorry, I, I missed I was out um, due to technical difficulty. So I missed what the original question actually was, um, but just have been following the conversation. And I think it's really um, interesting to kind of hear from folks who are familiar with her kind of growing up in Delhi and in India and what that what that environment was like to see like the the reach of the book. Um, it's, it's interesting to hear for for me as well. Yeah, I, I, all I had to add was just that I think actually, you know, I agree the, with that she probably wouldn't have been able to get the book published here in that same time frame. I don't know. I don't know what would happen now, actually, but um, I think I think back then the the style somebody called it one of the critics. I think Australian critic or British critic called it inexorable, inexorable or inex, inexorable. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something really insulting. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, you know, that, that particular style is just not, um, it's not very popular, like American uh, prose, prose style to use that many adjectives and um, to have that much contradiction within like single sentences. Like you have to be like a pretty um, deep reader to uh, get into contradictory sentences and fi still find the meaning of that sentence. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I don't, I think part of it is just that it won the Booker, right? And there's like kind of an American worship of Britain too. And so, right. um, <laughs> so that opened the door for her, but that's true. I think of like, of a lot of literature in general, that the literature being published in Britain is stylistically uh, a little bit more um, boundary pushing than the literature published in America first um, uh, by big five publishing. So a big four I actually don't even know <laughs> by the by the major publishers so I think it it I also think there's just not that many people even writing in that style in, in the first place like I just think I've been in so many workshops and it's I've never encountered any writer writing in this particular style it's very original and very much her right like there's a like a, a bite and a sarcasm that we're not like at least most Indian you know Indian women I know are not um socialized 
to be so uh, free with their with their critiques of everyone. That's that's an unusual, like culturally unusual uh, outlook. So I don't know. There's just some thoughts, but. Yeah, I think in as much as her style is very, uh, very, very unique and very her, as you um, correctly point out, I think, uh, Anita, I also think um, her style does owe a great deal to actually both Anglo-American fictions, but of a particular kind, you know, the stream of consciousness like Faulkner, and I know uh, Nagita also uh, pointed that out, like, um, Faulkner, Wolf, Dickens, and all of these people, um, but she is kind of kind of unabashedly using, adapting, and uh, even transforming that style in her writing 100 years later. Um, and I do wonder sometimes that in as much as her style is very distinct and different, does it have something to do with like, you know, people can still recognize this literary, very elite um, Anglo-American literary heritage in her writing, which is why of all kinds of idiosyncrasies that can happen in literary style, like her, her literary style has been praised and accepted and talked about so much. Um, like, you know, the fact that she could be co compared to a Faulkner, the fact that she could be compared to a Wolf, um, does it have anything to do with the the, the kind of uh, long staying reception she has, she has been, her book has been subjected to in uh, both UK and US? I really like that point. And it was one I was thinking about a lot when I first read this book. So I grew up reading a lot of Faulkner. He was always one of my favorite writers when I was coming up in middle school and high school, again, too young for it, but was reading it. And the whole time I was thinking, you know, there is this decolonization of that style that we're getting here. You know, it's unabashedly her context, but brought into a literary style that's accessible. And I also wonder, is that accessibility necessarily a bad thing that we're just, I feel like, you know, giving it that literary credence that we're giving based on its style. I mean, it was allowing us to get a narrative that we wouldn't have otherwise seen in the West. And I, I kept thinking all the time about what um, Anjali mentioned about would this book have been published in the West in its time or even now. And I'm thinking, no, first and foremost, not for its style, but because of its content. Um, yes. This book is about transgression at the very end of it. It's unabashedly about transgression. And especially, you know, with Lahiri's style sort of guiding what we were seeing from Indian writers in the West, which is not literature about transgression. It is literature about following rules and about living within sort of a context that has been set aside for Indians in the diaspora. This book feels so much more unique and whether that style kind of helped it along and helped it infiltrate kind of a literary elite, I'm, I'm grateful to it because it just basically shows us that we can have books about transgression told that I think now we're starting to break away from that idea of only writing within what's accepted. We're starting to see that more now, but I think for a long time, at least the books I was given and grew up reading were very much about rule followers in terms of a stylistic and from a content standpoint. I, I want to echo what uh, Malvika put so succinctly also to talk about, you know, the inherent Indianness of the book, uh, but also the inherent, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it's a book that's really faithful to the language of children. Um, and which is why these like flouting of, you know, writing rules uh, or, you know, a, an adjective heavy, um, uh, you know, uh, description style, uh, you know, and almost an obsessive, uh, uh, you know, uh, obsessive fealty to uh, sensory details, right? Uh, this is something that many of us uh, may feel did not completely, you know, uh, feel appropriate in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, right? Which is a book that we all felt a little bit, you know, divided over, uh, even in our in our love of it. And so, but in this book, that confusion is never there because even though, yes, as as Anjali put it earlier, this book does inhabit 
all its characters at various points, it is firmly and, you know, with a laser sharp focus on the side of the two children, right? They are the anchor of the story. And so when the story takes these textual liberties, it makes sense because, you know, the children are the narrators, but also the people driving the story with their actions and their choices. Um, and I think about that as, uh, one of the most radical things about the text that this is a children's book for adults, right? That it is yeah. that, you know, that the, everything that they're seeing, which I didn't understand as a child myself, I was able to understand closer to adulthood, right? That I was able to understand, um, you know, the subtext while they were only noting what they saw, right? So the, you know, whether the, the every time the novel, you know, describes the iron, you know, smell of the blood over and over again, that is the detail of a child, right? But there are these other subtextual details around it that we notice, you know, with more maturity. Like this time reading, rereading it, I noticed things that I hadn't noticed, you know, in some of my previous readings, and I'm sure that happened to other pandas. And so um, I think about that is a very Indian folklore style right to tell a children's story for adults right it's you know um, it, um within an american context that's not an accepted notion of storytelling right in american context children's stories are for children and adult stories are for adults but we always have had uh precocious you know child gods and you know other you know uh, or even krishna as a baby right this idea of like somebody driving a narrative that is far more metaphysical and far more you know grander than the sum of its parts and so what the story what the story does is what we've always known of indian folklore to do and which is why i also think that it could only have been an indian author to write the story who lives in india who lived you know all of that yeah i i yeah I, that's so interesting I, I really i love what you just said um and i just also want to just say that i think that she gets to do whatever she wants because, um, and she does it successfully because she does it with enormous empathy, right? With enormous empathy for everyone. As much as there are villains, she doesn't paint anyone as a villain, right? She just shies away from these tropes. And so every aspect of this book is done with dignity and compassion. And that's why I think it's so successful. And that's why we can enter it as a young person and then re-enter it as somebody who's a little bit older and, and has been out in the world a bit and and get something new every single time we do reread it is because we're just coming at it and she is it's so layered and it's so beautifully like compassionate and humane that we are just able to engage with it of, over and over again and only like you know I feel like she was one of the first people to show um the reader how to do that you know like how to read with compassion and, and give and confer dignity on all of the characters, regardless of whether we liked them or not, right? I think what's also different about how we're talking about this book now versus then is I feel like this book really took on generational trauma in a way that, I mean, I can't speak for how it was when the book came out, but now generational trauma is starting to have its moment and mm -hmm. we're starting to see it so much more in literature, but we're re we really saw it almost built in this book, you know, the impact of generational trauma. And you can only get that truly through the perspective of children. When you see how early trauma can set in and how it can change throughout one's life, I feel like that's something readers now might have greater appreciation for now that we're even seeing things like Disney movies take on generational trauma. It's becoming something that children can relate to in addition to adults, you know, being able to recognize it. And I just wanted, this is one of the books where I really felt like, wow, this is, you know, giving a name to something that, you know, in the past I may not have had a name for and really just showing how much more powerful it is when you're seeing children trying to interpret that trauma in ways they know how. I think the, I think it was Nina Sudhakar on Twitter who uh, pointed out how Papachi's mom um, is such a perfect literary device. And I, again, like this is what I love about this book is every time I read it, maybe I'm just not very bright, but every time I read it, I, you know, I was like, oh yes, of course, Papachi's mom, like why, do, 
I read this book like 15 times. Why didn't I see that? But every time I see something new um, when I read, and you know, just I, I wanted to. Uh, we kind of we we finished about an hour of conversation, and I was wondering if we could open um, up the floor to a few audience questions. If everybody anybody's interested, you can unmute yourself, and you know, um, if you're comfortable, uh, start video and ask a question that we'd be happy to ask. Like maybe we can do maybe three questions, three audience questions. So don't be shy. Hi, I have a question. This is Tanima. Hi. Hi. So it's not exactly related to um, to the book itself, but there was a lot of discussion about you know the her having won the Booker Prize, right? And um, it's um, so I wonder are there literary prizes that are given in India to Indian authors because there seems to be this um, need to satisfy an audience that is not Indian and. It, it almost seems like it would be better to have an an Indian prize, you know, which is given acclaim and given uh, prestige, which and it would make it easier for Indian authors to write and sell their books. Uh, the Sahitya Academy, for one, which is primarily like it's the Booker Prize of India in that many ways because it has uh, propelled writers to national mainstream. Right? We, I mean for people who you know, probably don't get to read a lot of Indian literature in English, Saitya Academy also does regional language awards, but like writers like Kiran Nagarkar, for instance, who is, you know, uh, I mean, reevaluated with recent events, but I speak, you know, primarily as a writer who remains one of, you know, at the very forefront of Indian writing in English. Um, and just because uh, Kiran Nagarkar who also writes very Indian books, very Bombay books, uh, and you know may not uh, have had that same level, you know may not have had the Booker Prize recognition. Doesn't change the fact that Kiran Nagarkar is a bestseller, and so much of that happened because of the support of organizations like Sahitya Academy. So um, I know they're awarding changes with governments, as everything does in India. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a you know take it with a grain of salt kind of a thing. But yeah, well, and that's sorry. that's. Uh, so, so I, I want to get over and let someone else speak, but I did want to thank the panelists. You guys are doing a wonderful job and very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I just, uh, I wanted to add to about the, so the, the poet Sohini Bhasak wrote a really interesting uh, article in Outlook um, about Tomb of Sand winning the International Booker Prize. And like, does this, is this going to open a door? You know, that's a question that we're inevitably asking every time. Like, is this going to open? And like I think the conclusion for for in that article was that it open it'll open a door for this book, but not necessarily for other writers. And when it comes to like why we discuss it in in through the lens of like Western prizes and stuff, the Tomb of Sand, uh, Tomb of Sand, sorry, was out in India for quite a while, I believe, before it was published in the UK. Um, I know for a fact that sales of that book skyrocketed in India after it won the International Booker Prize. It, the, the book has sold 50,000 copies in India after winning the International Booker Prize. So there is no doubt that validation of these prizes are not just for books to succeed in the West, but for them to succeed in India as well, which is a sad or a, it's a reality, you know? And I think that is why no conversation can be complete without like, you know, also viewing the book through this lens, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you can write the best book in the world, but if nobody knows about it, then no one's reading it. So, so the practical matter is that, you know, uh, there is, th that's why we need the community, right? It's so that when we see a good book like this, right, we can shout it from the rooftop and somebody will shout with us and our voice will be heard, right? Because, because there are so many great books out there, but they aren't getting the attention because they're not, they're not on any platform that, that, that is, you know, that we're getting to see. And so, so when we do run across books like this that are such gems and treasures, you know, it is our job as a liter good literary citizen to hold it up and go, I just read this amazing book, you know, who's going to read it with me? Right. If I may uh, just add to that, uh, there are 
tons and tons of essayists uh, who are doing some amazing work. Um, Sharanya Deepak, I wanted to give a shout out to Sharanya Deepak, I'll do that till I die, uh, who has talked a lot about Dalit cuisine, uh, talk, talked a lot about how to look at literature uh, from the from the caste perspective, how I, as a belonging to a particular caste or a particular religion in, in India, how I would be uh, looking at uh, you know, piece of work or, or food, for example. Um, uh, Talia uh, Lakshmi Kaluri's book is coming, What We Fed to the Manticore, is looking at climate change and political um, uh, political issues uh, from the perspective of animals who really are not speaking to us. So I think we, we have quite a few people uh, who are writing, but we, we don't uh, as South Asian, as the South Asian writing community, I don't think we talk enough about essays who, who publish in, in journals that you may or may not know of. So just wanted to add that to this discussion. Also, I think uh, when it comes to the Booker or, you know, prizes like this sort of Pulitzer and so on, um, whether or not they are open to, um, you know, people from all over the world in terms of who gets nominated, the um, from the outside, it seems like these are truly international awards. And so a lot of this celebration in India are people, uh, you know, running to get their copies of Tomb of Sand now or, book, uh, you know, God of Small Things at the time is this very skewed kind of nationalism really it is that you know the international community has recognized this great thing that has come out of India so now let's go and buy the book it's, it's not really this true support of literature that we might want to think of it sometimes it's mm -hmm. like nationalism and which is why Arundhati Roy has you know spoken in interviews about um, trying to distance herself a little bit from a lot of the fanfare in India about her winning the booker back in 97 98 because she felt uh, you know it was uh, positioning her to become like this literary uh, uh, rep uh, uh, this literary figure alongside uh, India winning Miss Universe, Miss World, and like, you know, new India becoming a nuclear state and all of these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Vijaya, you, um, I, I have a quick question. You interviewed her, right? When I did, I did in yeah. 99, I brought her to university. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I brought her to and I interviewed her on stage. Yeah, I had dinner with her like a few months before to discuss it, you know, at Stanford at her hotel there. So that was really amazing <laughs> in um, May of 1999. And then in, uh, I think I brought her in September, October of 99 as part of a series called Voice, Memory and Landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I've been teaching a class around that too. And so that, what I brought her under was when she was working against the Narmada Dam, The Cost of Living. That was the book that she did. Um, and I was really moved by her sort of anti-nuclear book to the first little black book that she did that came out, right? I think it was called The End of Imagination. It was mm -hmm. a little pamphlet. Yeah, to listen, oh, yeah. I, mean, I read that, like that was, I think came out the year or two after uh, the paperback of The God of Small Things. And that just blew me away, you know? So, and I'd been working as an activist on the commons from like January 84. So I really connected with her more as an activist, you know, as a fellow activist, you know, than I did as a, uh, you know, as a fellow writer or, you know, at that time. So I think, um, you know, she was, she was really exhausted. You know, she had just come straight from India and, you know, she lost her luggage. So she was kind of, you know, um, uh, just very tired but she the minute she came on the stage because I spent the whole day with her like I don't know 18 hours because it was I brought her as a part of my Davies chair and um, she was just so generous with the students we had a four hour three hour seminar um, and it was like 15 students and I don't think the students understood you know who she was, <laughs> who she was really. yeah, yeah. I'm like you yeah. know this is really a rare privilege you know right, right. Um, and you know, she was also, you know, just tiny, you know, like petite in the, in the, in the physical sense. And so, but, you know, a huge presence, of course, you know, in spite of that. Um, and so I think, um, and the interview was mostly around, you know, of course it was about God of small things, but mostly about the water work 
um, you know, and the Nadmada, the anti Nadmada, um, you yeah. know, the Nadmada Valley movement right. with Hadkar and, and all that. So that was really what we, and I worked with the International Rivers Network that co sponsored it. Um, mm -hmm. that was also on the stage with me so the three you know the three of us were together in a conversation and um yeah it was really it was an amazing year because I interviewed Salman Rushdie too right I, I remember <laughs> that that's right yeah. so I know pretty wild. it's so interesting when we finally get to meet our literary heroes right it's yes like, yeah <laughs> yeah 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 it was interesting I think you know Roy was more serious than I expected her to be yeah. as a presence you know and part of it was I think the weight of the world on her you know, because um, I remember, you know, the difference between standing in line, like the first time with the hardcover and the, and the paperback. Um, and I remember just asking her, like, what is it like to be having all this attention on you? And she just looked at me like near tears. You know? and she just was like, it's horrible. Yeah. You know, she's a very shy person, very private. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, she's not, it was interesting because I wanted to introduce her to sort of the key activists in the Bay Area with the environmental movement, but she was very shy about meeting them, you know, mm -hmm. unlike other people. So it was, it was an interesting thing for me to discover, you know, about her difficulty in sort of those sort of small or group social situations. But then the minute, you know, she was on the stage, it was, she was an actress. That's what I realized. I was like, oh, she knows her lines and she's acting. So right. she, knows, you know, honestly, right. she knows how to be an actress. Right. So then she's got, you know, she's got her lines memorized. And so, but it always appears spontaneous, right? right. So all those things kind of struck me, you know, about her. I was very moved by her, really. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I just said to her, like, you know, when I, I, you know, when, before I knew her a little bit was, you know, that you have to protect yourself in the right. face of this fame. And you have to do whatever you can to protect and she, you know, because she said, I don't know who I am anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and I said, you have to protect that at all costs. And right. she looked at me and she just, you know, I'm, I was one of 500 people standing in line, you know, at that point in 97, 98. But it was interesting because she, um, she was struggling with that. And it was very moving to me to, for her to be so radically honest. And I think that's what also struck me too. She, she spoke, I mean, we, we, you know, bandy around the word authenticity a lot and it's become even like in the MBA world oh you know how do it's ridiculous but it's like it's become a key word there but I, I think I found her to be one of the most authentic people I've ever met in my life yeah you know, there was just not many layers of pretense if she was tired she was tired yeah. you know if she was uh she didn't have something to say to a question she's I don't have anything to say to that you know so she was very, um, like Grace Paley. She reminded me of Grace Paley a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, short story writer. Grace, Grace was like that too. Grace was very, uh, just completely herself, you know. Uh, Anjali, uh, uh, you had put something in the chat and it just ran by me. Uh, she has a, another book of, of her essays. Can you so talk there's about? a relatively recent compilation of her essays and speeches. I actually have it right here. It's back. It's thick. You can see that there's, I mean, uh, you know, her, her, uh, I, I think uh, audiences outside of India probably are not as familiar about her nonfiction writing. It is, uh, it, it is, it's so, uh, aside from the fact that uh, it, the prose are also beautiful, um, you know, I think there's so much to learn about uh, activism. And actually, uh, it, it, her nonfiction has been extremely uh, inspiring to me as an organizer here in Georgia, even though I, I don't organize around any of the same issues Roy does. Um, but it's very uh, in, instructive about, you know, a, a lot of the, the conversations that we have today about uh, what what it means to be an activist, what it means, what does social change mean? How does it happen? Uh, who who should be given the platform for uh, various social mo uh, change movements? Um, Roy, uh, you know, was ad was addressing this uh, decades ago, right? Uh, uh, you know, um, she is very conscious uh, uh, about how she positions herself and. Vijaya, when you were talking, I was thinking to myself, you, you know, um, Roy doesn't situate herself as a leader in movements. 
she eschews that uh, particular identity. So I imagine, uh, you know, and I, I've never met Roy, uh, this is a little bit of projection, but I imagine if your lifelong role as an activist has, uh, has been to, uh, to certainly speak out publicly and write publicly uh, about oppression, but to otherwise cede power, right, to those who are most affected, most impacted by uh, whatever issue that she's talking about, it would be very difficult then to suddenly be a famous novelist and to suddenly have the spotlight constantly uh, shifted to you. And, and, and I wonder, uh, and maybe she revealed this to you in, her, in, in the interview or into an interview elsewhere, I don't know. I, I wonder if she at times felt that her fiction writing uh, undermined the the work that she has had been building her entire life around. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, so, perhaps yeah. she's addressed that in other interviews, but but I imagine if the, the propulsion of your whole life is yeah. uh, is fighting uh, uh, caste oppression, uh, uh, environmental uh, changes, uh, capitalism, that it would be very difficult for, even if you are writing a quote political book, it would be very difficult for suddenly many people to know you more for your fiction than, I mean, this is, this yes. is a life, this is many life's works of, of, of nonfiction, of very important political writing. Yeah. And to sort of draw on that concept a little bit. So in Azadi, which was, um, I know Mother Shree put it in the chat and she and I got to speak about it on my show a few months ago, but in Azadi, which came out, I think a year or so after My Seditious Heart, she, the subtitle of that book is Freedom, Fascism and Fiction. And in some of those essays, oh, yeah. she does address kind of her dual reputations as a writer of fiction and a writer of nonfiction. And one of the conclusions she came to that, which I found very inspiring was that people that, you know, capture my fiction as non-political and my non-fiction as political are missing the point entirely. Yeah. And she basically sees this as two sides of her existing activism and that there's no um, lack of truth. It's two versions of truth, so to speak, is how she presents her fiction. It is two different ways of creating a truth. Yeah. And I just found that incredibly inspirational. And that book in particular, I think, especially for Indians in the diaspora, looking in from a Western perspective, she, with that subtitle fascism as well, speaks a lot to just the global rise of fascism that we're seeing throughout the nation in India, as well as in the West and drawing those parallels in a way that I really needed to see and to read. And so I really like that she does acknowledge that kind of dual reputation that she has, but it definitely is one and the same. If you are reading The God of Small Things and not picking up the politics, you're missing yeah. the book. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. That's, she talked about um, that actually quite a bit. Yeah. And Azadi she, also has, um, uh, you know, it's it was written right when the pandemic started. So there, there, are, there is that, that address of the haves and the have nots and who gets to stay at home and who doesn't, which I know we've talked a little bit about it. We really haven't talked about the farmers in this country and, and what's happening here in, in America. And, and in India was a hundred times worse, given that there's a fascist nationalist government um, that's ruling the place. Right. Well, we have to wrap up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, but we're going to have to wrap up soon because Jenny said to keep it under like an hour. We're above an hour, but I hate to cut this fascinating conversation short, but I think we'd have to have last comments. And um, at the end of it, can you again, just I did a really crap job of taking the last screenshot. So one more time with all your books. up. Maybe we should invite the people attending too. Oh yeah, but I, I can only fill in like as uh, nine books. Okay, yeah, hold it up high and thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, thank you everyone for being here today. And thank you to the panelists uh, and thank you to the audience for asking such amazing questions and also the uh, comments in the chat. I've wish we could address and I wish we could talk more about this, but hopefully this won't be the first and last community read that we do for um, writers in our community. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.